My great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Joe Fai from the Free University of Brussels. So he'll be speaking about uh, the relation between Einstein geometry and the synthetic geometry. Thank you uh, very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, so as, uh, as Tom says, uh, the story I want to tell you today has two parts. Um, there's a piece about Einstein's equations in dimension 4, and there's another piece about symplectic geometry in dimension 6. So I'm going to tell each part separately, and then the really interesting part happens when you have both of these geometries in play at the same time, and you can, you can use techniques from one to try and prove results in the other. But that's, that's a little way off. Um, so uh, let's, let's begin with the Einstein's equations. So the, I should say actually this is a joint work from various places um, with Dmitry Panov. And here on Krasnov. Um, Dmitry is a Russian mathematician and Kirill is a Ukrainian physicist and I'm kind of stuck in the middle. <laughs> I'm helping them communicate. Um, okay, so, uh, right, so the Einstein side of the story is motivated by Jan Mills' theory. So I'm going to begin just by saying, recalling a couple of features of Jan Mills' theory that are salient for, for what I want to say about Einstein's equations. So the, the basic setup is you have a, a vector bundle over a Riemannian manifold. So let's say this is a Hermitian vector bundle. <coughs> Family of Hermitian vector spaces parameterized by your, your manifold. And Yang Mills theory studies connections in this vector bundle that preserve the Hermitian structure, so unitary connections. And you want to, you want to talk about the energy or the Yang Mills action of such a connection. So here A is a compatible connection. And what you do is you look at the size of the curvature of A in L2. So there's a, a whole theory devoted to this in both mathematics and physics, but I just want to point out a couple of, a couple of points. So the, the critical points of this action functional solve the Yang Mills equation, which looks like this. Um, so either you know or you don't, if you don't, it doesn't really matter what this looks like. It's a kind of, it's a kind of generalization of Maxwell's equations. But for our purposes, the important things are that it's the second order in A. Um, okay, and uh, if you want to find critical points of this, then a sort of naive thing that you might do is, is look at the gradient flow of this, this action. So you have the, this is the yang Mills equation, and you have the yang Mills flow. This is a kind of nonlinear analog of the heat of the heat flow, called the Yang-Mills flow, and it's at least parabolic in some geometric sense. Almost parabolic. After gauge fixing. So after gauge fixing, exactly. That's, so that's what I mean by geometrically parabolic. It's not it's not parabolic, but the failure to be parabolic is, is well understood. So you have short time existence for this flow, and you might hope that it converges to critical points of uh, of the connection, of the, of the action. Um, okay, now, now we come to something very special. So in four dimensions, something very special happens. <coughs> and to explain what that something special is, uh, I need to use a piece of four dimensional linear algebra, which if you, if you work in four dimensional geometry, this is kind of completely old hat, but um, I guess not everybody here does. So, so perhaps I should explain this. So two forms in four dimensions split. So this space is six dimensional. It splits into two three dimensional pieces when you have a, when you have a Romanian metric. And there are various different ways of seeing this. So one way is to use the Hodge star. So the Hodge star squares to one on lambda two and it equals plus or minus one on these two subspaces, the self-dual and anti-self-dual forms. Okay? So if you've seen the Hodge star before, then you've probably seen self-dual and anti-self-dual forms. 
So what's a, a, another way of thinking of this, if you're uh, less used to Romanian geometry, then uh, one thing you could do is you could use the, the, the metric. These are skew-linear forms. You have so it's a bilinear form that's skew. If I use the metric, I can identify this with skew-symmetric matrices. And then this Lie algebra splits is the sum of SO3 plus SO3. And that's the, the, the same splitting that we have here. Okay, so it's another way of seeing this if you're more familiar with these exceptional isomorphisms than, than Romanian geometry. And then kind of, if all of this is all a bit abstract for you, the most sort of direct way to do it is to just choose an orthonormal frame and then you can write down what the self-dual forms are and what the anti-self-dual forms are. So here I'm giving you the example of what spans. So this, this spans lambda plus. But then there's something to check, of course, that this didn't depend on the frame you chose in the first place. Yeah. So there's various different ways of seeing this splitting, but the, the, the key point is that, that in four dimensions on a Romanian manifold, two forms split into two pieces, self-dual and anti-self-dual. And that's going to be very important for, for the rest of the talk. So what does this mean in, in yang Mills? So this, this norm of the curvature tensor It's the same thing as, of course, the size of the self-dual part plus the size of the anti-self-dual part. So that's at least as big as if I inserted a sum in the middle. And what's important here is that actually this number here doesn't depend upon the connection at all. So this turns out to just be some topological invariant of the vector bundle. I think I have a feeling I've set pi equal to to four here. There's some, there's some constant depending on pi. Um, but but let's, let's, yeah, let, let, let's pretend that whatever that constant is, I've absorbed it in my definition of the first country argument. Anyway, there's, there's, there's some topological constant that doesn't depend at all upon the connection. So you have some non-trivial lower bound for this, um, this yang Mills action, and the magic happens if you attain this bound, you can see that this, this is, these two are equal precisely when this piece of the curvature vanishes completely. Okay? So there's topological bound which is attained when the curvature, one, one piece of the curvature, the anti-self-dual part, vanishes. Okay? And this equation is first order because it's, it's algebraic in the curvature. First order equation. Okay, so that's all I want to say about, um, about Yang Mills. Um, but the goal is to do something similar for Einstein's equations in four dimensions. So, what we're going to do is so, traditionally you think of Einstein's equations as an equation for a Romanian metric. Okay? But we want to set it up as a gauge theory. So, gauge theory means a, a model on connections. So, what we're going to do is we're going to study a certain bundle, certain connections. And out of these connections, we're going to build Romanian metrics. Okay? Then we'll have an action functional for the connections, and its critical points will give you Einstein metrics. And there'll be some special topological bound, and when that's attained, you have a special class of Einstein metric. And again, you'll have these second order PDE for the general critical points, and a first order PDE for these, these special topological um, maxima. Okay, so let me explain how this goes. And I should stress that I mean, Einstein's equations make sense in any dimension. What the story I'm about to tell you now is a strictly four dimensional phenomenon. Okay, so we, we have to start with the definition. Um, so, okay. Let's start with the So we're going to take a Four manifold with an SO3 bundle over it. And we're going to only going to look at connections that are compatible with this SO3 structure. 
just going to look at any connections. We're going to look at ones which solve a sort of uh, a differential inequality. So we're going to say that A is definite. If, okay, so I take the curvature, the curvature eats two vectors and gives me back an endomorphism, and I want this endomorphism to not be zero as long as u and v are independent. So these, these connections, they're as, as curved as they can be. Every time that their, their curvature has a chance to be non zero, they are. And these are exactly the sort of connections you need to be able to define uh, a metric out of these guys. Okay, well, I'm going to give you another way of looking at this, uh, this inequality that will be useful for me in a minute, and it might also explain why we chose the name definite. So you can choose a, a sort of, so this, this two form with values and endomorphisms, this curvature, these, these are just rotations of a three dimensional space. Okay, so if I choose a frame for E, I've got my x called my x axis, my y axis, and my z axis, then this curvature is just a triple of three, it's just a triple of two forms. Okay, the rotation around the, the two form that gives rotations around the x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. So I can sort of write <coughs> the curvature is just some sum of a triple of two forms, tenths of these rotations around the, the three coordinate axis. Okay? And then these two forms, I can let me write it like this. So I can take these two forms, I can wedge them in pairs. That's now a four form, or actually a, a matrix of four forms, and then I just divide by my favorite volume form, and I get I get a matrix. I get a oops, I get a three by three matrix, symmetric three by three matrix, and this matrix is definite precisely when this condition holds. So it's three by three. So how whether, I guess, it's, whether it's positive, definite, or negative, definite, it just depends on your orientation. Absolutely. Yeah. So you can you can now force an orientation on the manifold by asking that it makes this positive definite. That tells you the sign of your volume form. Okay. So already we see definite connection implies orientable. It actually implies a fair bit more, as, as I'll discuss in a minute. Okay. So how how can I build a metric out of this guy here? So this is this is what I want to do. I want to use this connection as a potential for the metric. Just like in, in electromagnetism, the U1 connection is a potential for the electromagnetic field. And that's the, that's the motivation. Um, and it works like this. So, so this is another, another fact from, from uh, I guess, four-dimensional linear algebra. So, so if you remember what I was talking about here, if I, if I give you an inner product on R4, then the skew symmetric, um, the, 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 the lambda 2 splits as a direct sum of these two three dimensional pieces. Okay? So it turns out that if I scale the inner product, I don't change this splitting at all because it doesn't change the Hodge star. Okay? So I can take a, a, an inner product up to scale on R4. These are in one to one correspondence with splittings of lambda 2 into two three-dimensional pieces, okay? but not just any old three-dimensional piece will do here. You have to have the following property. Um, you need a, a basis for this guy of two forms which have exactly this property. Okay. The wedge product is positive. Exactly. exactly. The plus. And lambda minus is perpendicular to it. Exactly. exactly. So let me, <coughs> in a slightly longer sentence, 
what Claude just said. So in two dimensions, the, the wedge product on lambda 2 gives you a symmetric bilinear form once you divide by a volume form, and it's got signature 3, 3. And when you have a Riemannian metric, it singles out for you a subspace where it's positive and the orthogonal complement where it's negative. And if I give you two subspaces like that, then up to scale, there's a unique inner product on R4, which will recover the form. So this is a, just a piece of linear algebra, and I think the easiest way to convince yourself it's true is to just count the dimensions of the two spaces. Yeah. That's, that's almost <laughs> Okay, so we already see what we're supposed to do here. These, these uh, connection, these curvature two forms, they're exactly what we need to define a lambda plus for our, for our metric. So we've given the metric up to conform. <coughs> so we get, for any definite, we can build a conformal class. Uh, such that lambda plus of this conformal class is the span of these elements. And it's the unique conformal class that makes our connection an instanton. And then to the self dual instanton. In, in other words, this, this equation here that came from my motivating discussion about Yang Mills is automatically satisfied. That's, that's how we define this, con this conformal structure. Yeah. So now, to, to pick a metric, we need to specify the scale. So we need to give a volume form. So. Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what the answer is, and then I'm going to try and justify it. This, this was actually tricky part of the story. And when I tell you the answer, you'll be astonished that I thought it was tricky, but I, I definitely did the wrong thing for at least a year until I spoke with, with Kirill about this at length. He'd been working on a similar thing independently, and he explained what to do. So how do we find this volume form? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to pick any on volume form and see what happens, and then I'll explain how to choose the right one. So, so let me be any volume form. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to demand that when I, when I look at this matrix, this Qij given by wedging these curvature forms together and dividing by mu, that this matrix is positive definite. Okay? That just, that's just the choice of orientation. So I choose any old volume form, I get this, 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 this Q. And you can see that if I change the scale of mu, it's the same as changing the scale of Q. Okay, so fixing the scale of mu is the same thing as fixing the scale of q. Yeah? So, so what you need to do is just decide some way of fixing the scale of q. So we choose our special volume form such that, so here's what I did to begin with. I did that. Okay? If you want to fix the scale of a matrix, you just choose its trace to be 1. Okay? You're allowed to scale a matrix by a constant, you might as well choose its trace to be 1. That's the same thing as saying, I'll take the first Contriagin form of my connection as my volume form. So if you know about Contriagin forms, that's, that's what this does. And that's not the right thing to do. Okay? The right thing to do is that. Okay? So I take the positive definite square root of Q, and then I ask that the trace of that matrix be 1 instead. Okay? So, okay, so why? Why does that work? Okay, so let's let's pretend a sort of I don't know, this sort of choice is best justified by kind of reverse engineering, right? So let's start with a solution to the problem and work backwards to find out what, what we should have done. Okay, so let's start with an Einstein measure. And this whole game is actually motivated by the following observation. So this, this game here is playing with an SO3 connection, but on a four manifold with a Romanian metric, there is a, a natural SO3 connection kicking around. So let's take Nabla to be the Levi-Shiverter connection 
on lambda plus. So lambda plus is a rank free bundle within a product. It has this metric connection, the levi shivita connection. And so I can look at this guy here. Okay? So I can, I can play this game, this whole game with this connection. So the first thing to notice is that, so you can, you can write in curvature as before for these triplet forms. And now Einstein tells you it's the same thing as these guys already being self dual Okay? So the Einstein condition is that the anti self dual parts of these two forms vanishes. Okay? Which means that if this were a definite connection and you played this game, you'd recover the same conformal structure as you started with. That's just that usually it's not a definite connection. Absolutely. And I'm going to come to that part of the story as well in a minute. But but uh, let's just pretend it was. <coughs> For example, in the full sphere, it's, it's a definite connection. Um, OK, so now let's see what this, what this Q looks like. So, OK, so this. OK, so this, this Q. If I use the, the volume form of G to, to, to define it, so I take the wedge of these x and divide by the volume form, then this is the square of a matrix. But it really doesn't matter if you've seen this or not. For those who have, I'm just going to write down what this matrix is. It's, it's the endomorphism of lambda plus given by the self dual valve plus scalar curvature. But that's somehow not important. The only thing that you need to know is the other thing that the Einstein condition tells you is that the trace of sigma is constant. It's up to some multiple the Einstein constant of this, of this game. So you can see what we want to do. We want to take the square root of this to be constant, have constant trace. And that's going to be great as long as all the eigenvalues of this matrix are the same sign. Okay? If they're all positive, it's great. If they're all negative, it's great. If they're mixed in sign, then we have a problem. Okay? But, but, but I'll come to that in a minute. So that's, that's kind of the justification for this, for this choice. Okay, so that's, that's a game of how to take a definite connection and build a Riemannian metric on your format fold. And now I need to tell you what the analog of the, of the yang Wall's action is. This is the following thing. It can be simpler. You just integrate the volume form. It's the total volume. And then you have to follow in theorem about this whole this whole story. So uh, critical point. Critical points A of S are those definite connections which give Einstein metrics. And this is a second order PDE for A. There's actually a topological upper bound for this for this action, kind of reminiscent of what we have in Yang Mills. It's bounded by the first Pontryagin number of e. We get up to some universal constant that I've set to be one, um, and this is equality if and only if the corresponding metric is anti-self-dual. And this corresponds to a first order PD for that. Yes, if you don't know what anti self dual um, metrics are, you should just think of it's not just. Einstein's equations are solved, but another piece of the curvature tensor vanishes as well. 
If you close one eye, they look flat. You already mentioned the relevant secretly I do. <laughs> this this piece is in. That's what happens for anti self dual. Okay, so I should point the picture. Yeah, self dual bar temperature. And there is a classical theorem of singular four, mm -hmm. uh, which basically has this result as a corollary. Mm -hmm. The result is that if you start with the curvature on the four manifold, mm -hmm. then it naturally defines uh, mapping of lambda 2 to itself, mm -hmm. which reverses these two, lambda plus and lambda minus. Yes. And the star operator does the same thing. Mm -hmm. So their theorem is that uh, <coughs> space is Einstein, and this is also in Bess's book. Mm -hmm. uh, that space is Einstein uh, if and only if R, the curvature operator on lambda 2, commutes with the star operator. Sure. Yeah, that's a, that's, and that's, yeah, that, that's what I said down here. Right, that's exactly what I said down here. But, I mean, yeah. but that's not a, this is, that this doesn't apply this theorem. <laughs> no, this, is, this would be a constant, but that speaks into plus minus parts. Induced metric on lambda 2. But this, this theorem starts with an A and no metric. No Romanian metric. It's just a statement about A. A then induces the metric. And what you need to check is that when A is a critical point for the volume fractional, the, the, the metric you get has this property. Okay, so I just wanted to make one more remark about this, which is that the first time I saw this, I was, I was surprised for the following reason. So this, this metric, as you've seen, is completely built out of the curvature. So the, the, the self-dual two forms, they're, they're, they're given by multiples of the curvature two forms. So the metric is first order in A. Okay, so the curvature of the metric is third order in A. So if you just naively write down Einstein's equations, they're third order in the connection. On the other hand, the critical point equation is second order. So you know already that something good has happened. And even better, the anti self dual Einstein equation is first order. It's of the same order as the metric. Okay? So one thing that this reminds me of a little bit, and I have no idea if there's any sense to pushing the analogy at all, but it's in, in Kähler geometry. So in Kähler geometry, you describe Kähler metrics in a fixed Kähler class using a Kähler potential. So you have some function that solves some inequality, and you should think of that as being the definite connection whose curvature solves an inequality. And then you want to ask what Einstein equations are. Well, the metric is second order in the potential, so if you just naively wrote it down, the equation will be fourth order in the potential. But something magical happens in Kähler geometry, and it turns out that the Einstein equation is only second order in the potential. Okay, so it's the same order as the metric which is exactly the same phenomenon as, as, as you have here. So this is a kind of some sort of fortuitous miracle that lets you know that perhaps you're doing something, you're, you're doing the right thing. So the Einstein constant is automatically non-zero. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. So I'll, 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 on that comment about that. So what Einstein metrics do you get literally by following this? So, What Einstein metrics do you get? Okay, so if you literally follow the story as I've just told you here, you can see that you needed this matrix, sigma, over here to be definite. You needed all of its eigenvalues to have the same sign. So, this is actually a very strong restriction. In terms of compact examples, the only ones that are known are uh, four sphere CP2 and hyperbolic and complex hyperbolic manifolds. So something else could happen. You could have one eigenvalue being positive and the other two being negative, say. And then you'd have been all right if you'd had a slightly more broad-minded interpretation of the square root. Okay? So if you would taken different branches of the square root, you can get guys where the uh, eigenvalues can change 
So now, now suppose we're in the, the next situation, which is, which is where eigenvalues vanish somewhere. Okay? So if you take a generic Einstein metric, whatever that, that might mean, like, I guess locally you can always, if you just put a, a local Einstein metric, no, no questions about completeness or compactness or anything like this, generically the eigenvalues will be different from zero, but they might vanish along co-dimension one. So, so what can happen is that you can you could have co-dimension one um, set where uh, eigenvalues vanish, and away from this set, there's a version of this story that will find your metric for you, and then you just need to understand what happens across this set. So in the examples, obviously the metric is smooth across this set, but if you stare at this PDE, it looks singular. Okay, so this is kind of you need, to, you need to have some theory of semi-definite connections. So a good example to play with where this happens is the page metric, where you can really compute what happens. Um, but perhaps I, I don't have time to go into that story, since I do want to get to symplectic geometry before 7.30. No, I can't see it. It's right when seven thirty. OK. So, um, then there's another thing to say, which is that this co-dimension one set, this was, this was a, a generic statement. The worst thing that could happen is that there's always an eigenvalue at zero. And that happens for Kähler Einstein matrices. So you cannot touch Kähler Einstein matrices. So here, you cannot, we, can, we, can, we can't get hold of the Kähler Einstein matrix because they're always, I mean, the, the Kähler form is in the kernel of this guy. But that's, that's okay, because we, we already know quite a lot about Kähler Einstein. It's, 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 uh, it's a holomorphic two forms that are in the current. Kähler form's okay. It's, it's ah, okay, yeah, sorry, you're right. Yeah. There's two zero eigenvalues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so we, we, we can't get these guys, okay? But I just, I just want to mention that there, there is a version of this story which doesn't talk about definite connections in an SO3 bundle, but instead triples of, def triples of connections in U1 bundles, who, who, which combine to be definite, which, which works for hyperformance. So there's a version which works for hyperformance. So the k Einstein but with zero scale effect. Okay, so I, again, I, I'm not going to discuss this, maybe I'll mention it at the end. So all that's missing in this, in this game up to things sort of choosing the appropriate square root. Well, that's just that there's a finite number of choices, that's okay. But this understanding what, what the condition should be for an arbitrary semi definite connection to capture all the Einstein metrics, ignoring this, we get everything except Kato Einstein surfaces and positive and negative scale effect. Okay. So the sort of natural questions that this leads to. One of them is, can you use this to find Einstein metrics? Okay, so I've given you an action whose critical points are Einstein metrics. Is there some sort of calculus of variations you can apply to find Einstein metrics? Um, and uh, I'll come back to that at the end when I've spoken about synthetic geometry, um, which is, give, gives at least some more motivation to try and find these, these Einstein metrics. All right, maybe you don't care about Einstein metrics, in which case I'm sorry I've bored you so much over the last half hour, but if instead you care about synthetic geometry, um, you can wake up again. I'm not going to mention Einstein metrics for at least another 10 minutes. Okay, so let's, uh, let's talk about a different problem but with the same uh, initial setup. So I've got, a, I've got an SO3 bundle over a 4 manifold. And I'm going to look at the unit sphere bundle inside this guy. I'm sort of secretly uninspired by twisted theory, but. Uh, <coughs> This is the unit sphere. So this is a vector bundle with SO3 structure. Or you can take the SO3 principal bundle on S1. Uh, yeah, uh, that's right. It's up to you. I, I think this is a vector bundle. Yeah. So e, e is a vector bundle with a with an inner product on each fiber, and it's possible to orient all the fibers coherently. And then I can take the unit sphere bundle inside inside E, and this is so this is a six manifold. And the game that I want to play is, well, every fiber of this six manifold has an area form. Okay? And now what I want to do is I want to fit the area forms together into a symplectic form on the whole of Z. So I want to fit area forms fibers 
And to explain, you know, I've, I've given this talk several times, or at least this part of this talk several times, and there are maybe 15 different ways of explaining how to do this, and every, and in a room of 15 people, they'll each prefer a different one. So I'm sorry if I'm the wrong one for you. <laughs> I think the one that involves the least chalk is the following. So I, to explain how to do this, I'm going to remind you how to define the area form on the two sphere um, using an idea of gas. So, the two sphere is, sits inside R three, and so you can think of the tangent spaces to the two sphere as being inside R three. Yeah? So you just take the tangent sphere, the tangent bundle to the two sphere is a sub bundle of the trivial bundle over, over the two sphere. Yeah? And then, obviously, if I project back the product connection in here, back onto here, I'll get the levy shibata connection of the two sphere. And then, finally, the area form is the curvature of this, of this connection. Okay? So now I'm going to do this on every single fiber simultaneously on Z. So, Z lives inside E. So let me let me call this the projection of this bundle pi. Okay, so Z lives inside E. Putting together all of the tangent bundles of the fibers, I get a vertical tangent bundle. <coughs> and this is a subbundle. So each vertical tangent bundle of a fiber is a subbundle of the fiber cross E. Okay, in other words, this is a subbundle of the pullback in E. Okay. So now, if only I had a connection in E, I could project it back down to V, and I would get a connection in V whose curvature was the area form on each fiber. Okay. Now, take A, N connection in E, and then let the number be the projection V is the pullback of A, and then let omega of A be the curvature of this map. And the way that we've done things, we've done this construction on every fiber. So this omega restricts to every fiber to be its area form. And it's a curvature form, so it's closed. Okay? So now we just need to know when is it when is it symplectic. So A is, uh, is an SO3 connection, so the yeah. omega A, it's actually, so you get a U1 connection, and omega is actually just an ordinary two form. Absolutely, absolutely. So this is a, this in two forms on it. In, in the same way as you, you add the connection on the tangent bundle of the sphere, you produce a two form. However it is you like to think about that, you do the same thing there. Okay, so then we have the proposition which was actually the, the starting point for Dimitri and I to even to think about definite connections. So omega A is symplectic if and only if A is definite. Okay? So this whole story that we had at the beginning about these definite connections that are potentials for <coughs> Romanian metrics, it secretly was a story about symplectic geometry. Okay? So, kind of the, the the, the moral is that you can use the symplectic geometry of omega to prove things about the Romanian metrics defined by the A's, and you can use the Romanian geometry of the metrics defined by the A's to prove things about the symplectic metrics. Okay? So there's a whole collection of results that you can prove in this nature, and uh, I want to tell you, I guess, just about two of them. So. Symplectic geometry of Z omega A to understand Romanian geometry <coughs> with the metric built by A and vice versa. Okay, so there are 
Right, two, two results that, that are proved in this vein, one, one in each direction. Okay, just to sort of, I don't know, like a sales pitch. Prove that it's given both directions. And in fact, uh, one of them, I don't know, I, I kind of understood that it should be true for a while, and I only really started seriously thinking about the proof on my flights over here from Brussels at the beginning of the week. So I haven't really checked every single detail since I'm being filmed. Maybe I'll just call this one a conjecture. <laughs> So what does the conjecture say? Well, there, there's various sort of ways of, of putting it, and I'm going to put it in a deliberately vague way. Um, so uh, a sequence of anti-self-dual Einstein metrics. Now Einstein manifolds, let's say MI, GI, with, let's normalize them so that the scalar curvature is equal to minus one. So you take a sequence of these guys, then compact or no, it's just a purely local statement. So, so they could all be non-compact metrics on a, on a, on a, on a ball. Um, and uh, I mean, secretly in my head, I'm thinking of prime query last night, but the, this, this, this is just a, a local thing. So the, this sequence, they can't develop a non-collapsed singularity. Cannot develop a non collapsed singularity. So, non collapsed, so singularity means that, uh, roughly speaking, so the curvature is blowing up. Okay? And non collapsed means that it's happening, but in such a way that the volume isn't, isn't shrinking. So the manifold is not collapsing to a smaller, smaller dimension. So, for example, if you take, take the product of two spheres and shrink one of the spheres to zero, that's a collapsed singularity. The curve is just blowing up because you're making one of the spheres very, very curved, but at the same time, you're, you're dropping dimension. Okay? On the other hand, if you don't drop dimension, then this sort of singularity cannot arise in a sequence of manifolds of this type. So, let me just say that if I put r equals zero here, then this is definitely false. Okay? So, you can... When R equals zero, this is the same thing as the, these conditions. Anti self dual Einstein scalar curvature equals zero this is the same thing as being hypercalar. Okay? And you can definitely find hypercalar metrics which develop orbifold singularities, and they're non collapsed. Romanian geometry that any Romanian geometer who'd never been to any talk about definite connections could look at and think about. But the proof is symplectic. Yeah. At least the idea that I had of how to prove this and the details of which I've checked on the plane, and uh, I'm fairly confident this is true. Okay, so what, what happens when a non-collapsed singularity is forming? Well, you, you rescale by the curvature to like one over the curvature to keep the curvature bounded and sort of zoom in to see what's happening. And what happens is, so you sort of take a blow up limit and you see an ALE gravitational instance on. So you see a gravitational instance on. So it really, it, I'm going to say a few words that maybe you don't know, it doesn't matter, in a minute I'll tell you the geometric consequence of all these words and that's, that's the bit that's important. You see a gravitational instanton, which is ALE. So these are non-compact, complete hypercalar metrics. And ALE, roughly speaking, means that at infinity they have Euclidean volume growth. Okay? And this Euclidean volume growth here is because the singularity is non-collapsed here. Okay? You're not losing volume here, so at infinity you have as much volume as you would in Euclidean space here. And the key point about these magical words is that it contains a, um, a minimal two sphere. In fact, so, unless it's actually, unless it's flat space. Right. So if, it, if it's flat space, there wasn't a singularity in the first place. 
So that's, that's what we want to prove, that this has to be a flat space. And we're going to get a contradiction out of the existence of this minimal two-sphere, and we're going to do it using symplectic geometry. And here's, here's how. So let's take a, a, a small digression. So now let, let's pretend that we have a surface inside our four manifold. And it turns out that you can lift this to Z. Let's call this F tilde. So, so what, why is that? Well, take a point in the surface and look at the tangent space to that point. The curvature of our connection tells, gives us a non-zero rotation. Okay, so it singles out for us an axis in the two sphere, and that's where I, I send this this bit. Okay. In fact, there will be two. So it'll be, it'll be but if this is a two sphere, then I can just pick one of the two lengths. Okay. And what's magical is that if, if this is minimal in an anti self dual Einstein manifold, this is symplectic. Okay. So actually, we're using the fact that the scale of curvature is negative. Right? Yes, critical. So scale curvature equals minus one j two holomorphic curve. Indeed, indeed. That implies that this f tilde is even j holomorphic, and so the integral over s of this symplectic form is is positive. It's strictly positive. Okay. On the other hand, this integral is a topological number. Okay. Because we've just integrated. Some characteristic class, effectively, sort of by Chen and Bay, over our over our sphere, it's just some topological number which turns out to be the Euler characteristic of the surface plus itself a dissection. It's this thing that appears in a junction for for surfaces in, in for, for curves in complex surfaces. And if you look at what it has to be, because oh, okay, I missed I missed the word right. So here, this minimal sphere, it's not just minimal; it's actually Polymorphic for some complex structure. So these, these gravitational instantons, they're hypercalar. They've got a two sphere of complex structures, and one of them makes this minimal two sphere complex. And then you can see that this equals zero. So you want to read back, I guess. You're, so you, you have a minimal two sphere in the limit, and then you want to approximate by a minimal two sphere. Absolutely. In the so that's that's the challenge, right? So you have this minimal two sphere in the limit which is actually holomorphic for some complex structure. So in the limit, you know that this quantity is zero. So what you want to do is you want to take a little step back just before the limit, just before the singularity was achieved, and find to perturb your sphere so it becomes minimal for one of the very non-existing metrics, and then you get a contradiction to the, to the adjunction formula here. That's, okay? that's in the that's in the so the, the, the whole game is, can you perturb this minimal sphere into a minimal sphere in one of these metrics, mi, where i is very, very large. Okay, so if you can do that, you get a contradiction, and then as Claude says, the only one of these guys without a minimal two sphere in it is flat space, and that meant that you weren't seeing singularity at all. But the, the whole proof just revolves critically around this, this fact here. Minimal spheres have positive adjunction. You need it in the same homology class as the. As the yeah, I mean, you're, you're even. You're, you're taking a small deformation. If you think about these, these metrics as living on the gravitational instanton, just very close to the original metric, then you can you just wibble the sphere slightly. It's a kind of implicit function. So you, you, you need this minimal two sphere here to be kind of quite stable isolated. And then, and then the implicit function theorem. <coughs> okay, so that's, that's one sort of theorem you can prove in Romanian geometry using symplectic geometry. And now let me tell you about the theorem in symplectic geometry that you can prove using Romanian geometry, or more precisely, hyperbolic geometry. So this one really, we have understood the details of the proof of this one, so I'm happy to call this one a theorem. So this was, this was with, with Dimitri. Okay, so let G be a finite representative group. And uh, let's just take some B, a natural number, 
then we can say two things. So there exists a symplectic six manifold X with pi one of X I small b to G and B two and B three bigger than B. So for every finally presented group, we get infinitely many symplectic six manifolds with the, with that finitely presented fundamental group, and the first chain class of X vanishes. So if you forgot you were doing symplectic geometry and thought you were doing Kähler geometry, these will be Calabrian X. Okay. So for a long time it was uh, a difficult question to understand how different symplectic manifolds of vanishing first chain class were from algebraic counterparts. And what this theorem tells you is that they're immensely different. They can have any fundamental group. Okay? Whereas a Kähler Calabi Yau, its fundamental group is virtually different. And the second thing I think was even, even more surprising, so if, if G equals the identity, we can also find, so arrange for B2 to be bigger than B and B3 to match. Yeah, the reason why this is, is quite striking is that on a, on a so, so this right, this is a Kähler, right? So on a Kähler Calabi Yam, C1 vanishes, it tells you that you have a holomorphic volume form, and then its really imaginary parts will give you something in middle cohomology. So this can never happen in complex geometry. Okay? And yet here we have infinitely many of these guys simply connected with B3 zero, but we can make B2 as big as we want. Okay, so just a huge number of examples. So let me just say very, very briefly how you, how you find these, these guys. Okay, so what do you do? Well, the idea is that if M is hyperbolic, <coughs> then Z has C1 equals zero. Yeah. So these, these hyperbolic, hyperbolic uh, four manifolds, they come from these definite connections, and they're, they're special, so that the negative curvature of M cancels out the positive curvature of the spheres in order to make the overall first chain class match. So the fir first chain class equals zero, and so now you want to try and prove this theorem by writing down lots of hyperbolic manifolds. But of course, hyperbolic manifolds, their fundamental groups are quite constrained, and in particular, they're, they're never trivial. Okay? So what you really do is you look at hyperbolic orbifolds. Okay. So these hyperbolic orbifolds, they will give you symplectic orbifolds with vanishing first gen class. And you can find them in such a way as to achieve lots of these, uh, to achieve any finally presented fundamental group, um, or indeed very complicated singularities which have, uh, which are effectively on uh, um, manifolds homeomorphic to the force field. Okay. Take take some uh, <coughs> symplectic polyhedron. So, sorry, some hyperbolic polyhedron and just double it. And then. So these these three symplectic orbifolds went to C1 equals naught, and and now we borrow a trick from algebraic geometry. So in algebraic geometry, if you have a, a singular sort of at least certainly let's say orbifold singularity in a complex threefold, you can resolve without affecting the canonical bundle. It's called a crepping resolution. So you, you get rid of the singularities without destroying this fact. And the, it turns out you can do the same thing for at least for these sorts of singularities that we come across here in, in this case. So it turns out that when you carry out these resolutions, it's pretty easy to see you don't affect the fundamental group, um, but you introduce lots of B2 and B3, or if you're even more careful, you don't change B3, but you introduce lots of B2. Um, and so the more complicated singularities that you have, the, the higher and higher you can make B2. Okay. 
So that's, that's how, roughly speaking, how you prove this result. So I should say that this part here relies critically on a beautiful construction of Panoff and Petrino. So what they show is that for any finitely presented group G, there's a hyperbolic four-dimensional orbifold, which, when you think of it just as a topological space, its fundamental group is G. Okay, which is a bit surprising when you first hear it, because if it was smooth, right, then its fundamental group would have to be a hyperbolic group. But, but if you allow all the fault singularities, and in fact of a very particular type, you can get any finitely presented group of G. So this is, uh, they, they, they were inspired, I mean, I think Dimitri was partly inspired by our work, but the main inspiration here for thinking about this is a question of Gromov, which is, can you write, given an n-manifold, can you write it as the quotient of hyperbolic n space by some discrete subgroup? But obviously, you're allowed to you're allowed to introduce all the four singularities, but up to homeomorphism, as I was discussing here, can can you achieve that? So I think it's known to be true in dimensions two and three, um, and it's completely open in, in higher dimensions. Okay, so I, I was going to talk about a whole series of open questions that, that come out of this, but perhaps it's a good idea to stop. And if anyone wants to hear the open questions, you can ask me after. Singular sets of these orbifolds are co-dimension two, and then you also have, like, I guess, a co-dimension four string. Is that the way it works? Or? Uh, but they're not just isolated singular. Oh no, they're definitely not isolated. Yeah, they're a complicated network of, of, of curves. Thinking of it as the complex geometry, so surfaces, right? Surfaces which meet some points, and so yeah, like you said, co-dimension right. four, co-dimension two. Yeah, but you can, you kind of locally, the picture is completely toric, so you can locally resolve them using toric geometry. And then there's just a game in making sure you can carry out all these resolutions consistently at the same time over the whole network of, of singularities. It's kind of it's an interesting exercise in symplectic cutting. Yeah. So when you're then trying to get rid of these singularities up in the, in the twister space. Yeah. Oh, no, they're, those singularities are in the twister space. Right, and so well. you have the same, you have yeah. the same code mentioned upstairs. Of, yeah. Somehow it's harder. I'd be interested in hearing the details. So you have sort of a singular set of. Yeah, I was only resolving. I, I don't touch the four manifold downstairs. I resolve. The, what, what, right. You resolve the six manifold. Right. And once you resolve the six manifold, you kind of. I mean, you still have a map back to the six manifold and then down to the four manifold. But. Um, so, what's a, what's a good way of thinking about it? So, well, yeah, I guess, I mean, the, the co dimension two set is, is topologically non singular, but I guess in terms of the symplectic structure. Right. It is singular symplectic structure along that. It's side. a kind of orbifold symplectic structure in the sense that in an orbifold chart it's smooth. Okay. Right, right. But can you get rid of that? Uh, I guess. But the point is that uh, that's right. If you take a if you take a two-dimensional cone, mm -hmm. symplectically it's the same as two-dimensional disk. Right. So that's not a problem. Yeah. So those are. Any other questions? I think in general, yes. I think if you add in additional conditions, I mean, this is a purely local result, right? I mean, I just spoke about metrics. You could replace this with a four ball, and you don't demand that the metrics be complete or anything. All, we, all that you need to do is be able to take the block limit and get to a gravitational instance. Right? So, but now, suppose you, you spoke about manifolds that are complete. Okay? So maybe they look asymptotically hyperbolic or something like that. Then, then I think it's much more constrained. But, but that's kind of a hunch, and I don't know how to prove it. Um, but again, I would be trying to look for minimal surfaces. So, yeah. I mean, maybe we can, we can talk afterwards if you're interested. But I have, I have ideas about, about how to start trying to address this problem, but I think it's a difficult question. Are there examples of orbifold that basically are uh, trying to sell to Einstein with a negative curvature? Yes, so do you have a hyperbolic so form that those cannot be. Kind of the They're not the limits of smooth curves, yeah. yeah. Isolated orbifold singularities, yeah. But I think, I think for example, uh, another question you might ask is if you took a hyperbolic four manifold with a, a hyperbolic four orbifold, which was singular on a two dimensional surface for a cone angle. Can you open the cone and turn it into something smooth whilst keeping it at itself to an ice bar? 
This, this doesn't rule that out. Right? It, it only rules out those kind of an isolated orbital force in that. Can I just interject a comment there? The uh, dedication of the wall over in the Simon Center is right now, so maybe we should adjourn immediately and people can. Oh, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right time, wrong day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and the questions. Uh, maybe it's a little question, but uh, have you thought about uh, the M4 as a Valencian signature? I mean, absolutely. Kirill is a physicist. His interest is, is gravity, quantum, quantum gravity. And there's a story of this that works for the Lorentzian signature. So you take SL2C instead of SO3, and then you have some reality conditions. This is the whole game. So you can, you can get Lorentzian, or you can get neutral signature, or whatever, just by how, the, how things sit inside the reality of SL2C. But I mean, maybe since you're a physicist, you, you, I, should, I should do some publicity for Kirill's work, right? So remember this game that we played with the trace of the square root of Q equals 1? Well, you could have chosen anything here, OK? Mm -hmm. And then you'd have got a different volume form, and you'd have got a different action functional that deforms the action that gives you gravity. Yeah. So there's a whole family of theories now in which one of the theories is Einstein's theory. And so the hope is that this family constitutes a renormalizable family. So this is this is his whole program. That, that was his main interest, was to find some new action principle for gravity that lived in a family which didn't exhibit the same problems as Einstein thought. Yeah. So, so mathematically, this action is much simpler than Einstein thought. Yeah, uh, I have in fact a series of papers on uh, general zero manifolds, manifolds, and in particular Lorentz manifolds, uh, very old stuff, basically, on top of my thesis going back to 1970-71. And it's all published uh, in the Journal of Mathematical Physics uh, and Journal of Differential Geometry and uh, extending to pseudo Riemannian structure stuff that we know in the Riemannian. So they are genuine gravitational instrument costs, not the fake Euclidean gravitational instrument costs. And so you can give a characterization uh, use, using very similar structure, leaving star squared is minus one. So it defines a complex structure there. And this was known also in physics literature that uh, if R it uses a complex linear transformation, then this is equivalent to Einstein's equation. And then one can generalize it to include uh, also specific tensor and uh, give such a characterization of full Einstein equations and then the generalizations. And those are the, those are all, all available there. Yeah, on the, yeah, on the max sign A too. Okay, let's thank Joe for this.